Thank you, Jane, and I join Jane in welcoming all of you, and I especially thank the Student Legal Forum, which year after year has made this roundup possible. It's one of the wonderful ways of kicking off the school year. As you know, we plan to look at selected cases from the most recent term of the U.S. Supreme Court. I will talk in general about the term for a few minutes, try to extract a few themes from the term, and then we'll have uh, a look at the three big marquee cases of the year, voting rights, affirmative action, and same-sex marriage. Now, rather than taking questions from the audience during the discussion, what, after we convene, uh, I'm sure that the panelists don't mind lingering for a minute if you want to approach any of them with questions about what they've had to say today. Uh, first, before they take you into the three biggies of the term, I want to suggest a few thoughts about the term, and I've given it the provisional title, uh, 10 Things Which the 2012-2013 Term Tells You About the Roberts Court. Roberts Court is now into its eighth year, starting in 2005. It's beginning to mature, so these, there's always a certain risk in taking any one term and trying to generalize about it, but I do want to see whether we can extract a few themes from it. Uh, first takeaway from this term, it seems to me, is that the Roberts Court proves once again that it's no stranger to judicial activism. Now, I grant it's very difficult to define activism. There are many ways of thinking about it. But certainly one measure of activism is whether the court is willing to defer to Congress or not. And we have prime examples. This term, two of them will be talked about in a few minutes. The uh, same-sex marriage case where the court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act and the voting rights case, Shelby County, where the court struck down the uh, Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, Justice Scalia's dissent in the Windsor case, the Doma case, is especially interesting. He called the majority opinion, and I quote, a jaw-dropping expansion of judicial review, an assertion of judicial supremacy over the people's representatives in Congress and the executive. Now, that's Scalia in the Windsor case. Uh, one wonders if his praise for the democratic process doesn't sound a little hollow when you then flip over to the um, to the Shelby County case, the Voting Rights Act case, where, of course, he joined those in striking it down. So judicial activism is alive and well in the court, and who does it and who doesn't may be in the eye of the beholder. Second takeaway is in the civil rights area, it seems to me that the uh, this term suggests once again that the Roberts Court is willing to roll back some of the, both the legislative uh, achievements and also some of the judicial precedents from the civil rights era. Once again, these are uh, the best examples are cases that will be talked about today. Uh, affirmative action survives Fisher, but uh, the court has tightened the standards that have to be applied. And, of course, in the voting rights case, you get a fairly remarkable uh, invalidation of Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act. So those will be two examples of at least those two areas where the court has seen some rollback. Um, third suggested theme from the term is about business. These cases that you'll hear about momentarily don't take that up. So I want to suggest to you that business, and especially big business, uh, has a lot to like about the Roberts Court. I mean, we could endlessly debate whether the Roberts Court is, in a sense, pro-business or not. That's perhaps a generalization. But one measure of how business does in the Roberts Court is to see how the U.S. Chamber of Commerce does. They file amicus briefs. They filed amicus briefs in 18 cases in this past term, and they were on the winning side of 14 of the 18. I think most people would consider that a pretty good track record. And indeed, in the most controversial cases, namely the cases decided five to four, uh, the chamber is on the prevailing side in all of them. So they have done pretty well. Indeed, so, uh, check back since Alito succeeded O'Connor in 2006, uh, the chamber has been on the winning side of about two-thirds of all the cases in which it had, had any voice. The two areas that strike me as being worth mention that affect business directly uh, one, and I think there's sort of a general theme here that at least in the cases I'm thinking about, the court has made the opportunity of individual litigants to get into federal court more difficult. One of the two areas I'll mention is Title VII, where the court has made it uh, more difficult to bring federal discrimination claims against employees. One involved um, the retaliation cases where the court laid down a but-for-cause standard, which is frankly, a difficult standard. 
And the other is a case where they significantly narrowed the definition of what constitutes a supervisor for the purpose of Title VII. Now, these are technical cases which I won't take the time to explain today, but I think you can mark them down in the eyes of business as a victory for them. And the other line of cases has to do with arbitration. I mean, all of you know about uh, sort of uh, uh, contract provisions which require you to go to ar arbitration and not, and not sue. There was a case, American Express versus Italian Colors Restaurant this term, in which the court invoked the Federal Arbitration Act to hold that the contract's provision waiving right to have class arbitration is valid. And they, they said courts must enforce such agreements even if they deny the plaintiffs any real adequate arbitra uh, any arbit adequate vindication uh, simply because plaintiffs one at a time, cases really aren't worth the while. Uh, Justice Kagan filed a particularly sharp dissent in the uh, American Express case, and she said, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And to a court bent on diminishing the usefulness of Rule 23, everything looks like a class action ready to be dismantled. So there's the business docket. Uh, fourth generalization or theme is, I want to say a word about criminal justice because that occupies so much of the court's docket. I'm bound to say that you, it's hard to slap a pro-defense or anti-defense, pro-law enforcement, anti-law enforcement label on this court. Law enforcement wins some and defendants lose others. Uh, for example, in the area of the Fourth Amendment, these cases tend to scramble the conventional notion about the lineup on the court, the so-called liberals and the so-called conservatives. And I'm thinking, for example, about Maryland versus King. That was a five to four decision in which the court held that police may use cheek swabs to get uh, to take DNA samples from suspects who've been arrested for serious crimes. Uh, Justice Kennedy wrote the majority opinion applying a balancing test, namely how important is this evidence to the state and how serious is the intrusion on individual privacy and held, he held in favor of the state. In dissent, you had Scalia, not, not thought to be soft on crime, who said that the Fourth Amendment categorically forbids the police from conducting suspicionless searches for investigative purposes. As I say, the, this case defies the conventional lineup you find in this and indeed in three other Fourth Amendment cases in this past term. You find in all those cases Scalia voting in favor of the defendant, and in those cases you find Breyer voting in favor of the government. So as I say, that gives you a little note of caution about uh, the lineup on the court. There is <laughs> something about the Roberts Court. They seem especially fond of cases involving drug-sniffing dogs. I don't know what it is about dog cases, but there's something about it. it got the court's attention. And in the two cases they decided this term, the court sided with the government in one case with the defendant in the other. Uh, one was Florida versus Harris, where the court was considering what evidence is needed uh, to show that a dog dog so-called alert um, is sufficiently reliable to establish probable cause to visit a, to search a vehicle. The Florida Supreme Court had laid down a quite strict test in these cases, and the Supreme Court, a unanimous court, by the way, in this case, rejected, rejected that strict test, had a much more flexible test, easier to satisfy, and therefore voted for the dog. I, I guess in this case you could say that the dog's uh, sniff was up to snuff. Um, in the other case, the dog was on the losing side. Dogs win one, dogs lose one. They lost this one, Florida versus Jardines. You may have read about this case where the, dogs, the drug sniffing dog was taken on the porch of a suspect's house, and the majority, Scalia writing for the court, cited U.S. versus Jones, the case last year about a GPS. He said that to, the test of a Fourth Amendment search is physical intrusion, physical intrusion, and he says social norms assume that you invite people implicitly to come on the porch of your house, but those implicit norms do not include uh, canine forensic investigations. Uh, Kagan uh, concurred in the case, and she agreed with the result, but she would have used a reasonable expectation of privacy test, going back to Katz versus United States in 1967. The dissenters, uh, speaking through Alito, disagreed with both rationales. They said that the, uh, the search was, was reasonable. 
Uh, fifth generalization, Chief Justice Roberts. It's clear now, to me at least, that he is the master of the long game. He's a young Chief Justice. He's going to be around for a long time. He can be patient. He can go step by step. And it seems to me the uh, classic example this term was Shelby County, the uh, Voting Rights Act case. And it's only, it seems to me, a small exaggeration to say that the writing of Shelby County began in 2009, several years ago, when Roberts wrote the majority opinion in the Northwest Austin Municipal Utility case. And in that case, the court avoided the constitutional question, uh, turned, had let the case turn on statutory interpretation. Eight justices, including Roberts, agreed with that result. There was only one dissent. Um, now, Congress may not have paid attention to Roberts, uh, uh, 2009 opinion, but the litigants certainly did. Shelby County certainly did, and we get the case that you'll hear about in a moment. I think that Roberts has been pretty consistent. You remember last year when he voted, he made possible the majority to uphold the Affordable Care Act. I mean, some conservatives were just went crazy at that point and said, oh, he's jumped ship. He's suddenly become a liberal. Well, you know, they should have gotten hold of themselves <laughs> because clearly, if you remember his opinion from last year, he did agree with the tax theory part of the opinion, but he also advanced in dictum with the other conservatives a constricted view of the commerce power, and that, I think, will be more important in the long term than the tax part of the opinion. So we have a consi largely consistent uh, conservative in the office of Chief Justice. Um, thought number six, Justice Kennedy remains, as always, the power broker on the court. He's the guy in the catbird seat. Uh, in this most recent term, he was in the majority in 91% of cases. That's more than any other justice. Roberts came in second. In the five to four cases, they had 23 of them, and Kennedy was in the majority in 20. So that's pretty high. A high batting average. He has been the justice most consistently in the majority in, in five to four cases every single term since 2003. So it's pretty, pretty consistently uh, the guy who has the important vote. Now, it is very difficult to nail down Justice Kennedy's judicial philosophy. He may not have one for all I know. I, I, I keep searching for it and I teach this stuff, so I, I don't know whether it's there or not. Um, it may indeed flow from his personal preferences. He sees, looks into his soul and comes up with an opinion. Uh, but there's some concept of personal liberty and human dignity that seems to sort of inform at least some of these opinions. Uh, the Windsor opinion, you'll hear about it shortly, certainly seems to be an example of that where he talks about the impact of DOMA. And there are earlier opinions that many of you will find familiar, Romer versus Evans, uh, Lawrence versus Texas, cases like that. Number seven, Justice Scalia continues to hammer away at familiar themes that by now probably all of you know something about. One of them is, is his commitment to originalism. It continues to inform his opinions. Uh, the Fourth Amendment cases that I just talked about are good examples where he goes back and looks at common law understandings of what would have been a trespass or a physical intrusion at the time of the adoption of the Fourth Amendment, as opposed to sort of evolving notions of expectations of privacy. The other Scalia theme, again, well known to you all, is his disdain for legislative history. And that manifested itself very clearly in this past term. Cases, for example, he joined one Sotomayor opinion, except for footnote number four, and you guessed it, that was a footnote exploring congressional intent. Another case he joined, a, there was a Ginsburg opinion, which was unanimous. Everybody agreed, except Scalia didn't like footnotes six and seven, because they went into Senate reports on the statute and the case. So he, he, as you know, he thinks legislative history is just a scam that's a way of, uh, it's a, a make weight you throw into a case when you really know how you want to decide it anyway. Uh, number eight, a comment on Scalia and Thomas. You know, pretty consistently voting together. They agreed in whole or part in the court's decisions last term in 82% of cases. That's a pretty high correlation. And their close relation has attracted the attention of none other than comedian Conan O'Brien, not usually thought of as a commentator on the Supreme Court, but he heard about Scalia and Thomas. And at the White House Correspondents' Dinner this year, uh, he said, and I quote, the Supreme Court seems divided over same-sex marriage. 
the liberal justices favor it, while the conservatives oppose any lifelong sacred union between two men, unless, of course, it's Antonin Scalia and Clarence Thomas. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, number nine, Ginsburg. Uh, at 80, she's the court's oldest member, and of course, liberals, some, of, some liberals have been pushing her to step down to be sure Obama fills her seat long before the next presidential election. Well, one thing you may, may be sure of is she has made it clear she has no intentions to retire. Forget it. Uh, this summer, she gave a pretty remarkable round of interviews to Reuters, USA Today, AP, New York Times, anybody who had listened, she would repeat, I am not going to retire. She says she's going to stay as long as she can do the job, in her words, full steam. And I would have to say, if you look at her opinions this last term, it looks like full steam to me. She wrote 17 opinions. That's as many as Chief Justice Roberts did. He's 58, so she's right up there with him. She's the court's most efficient justice. She turns opinions around in 60 days, which is the best record of any of the nine justices. In oral argument, she's the most frequent one at asking the first question, the one right out, 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 of, the, out of the box. So uh, she is clearly pulling her weight. She's become, in many ways, the le leader of the liberal bloc. Since Justice Stevens retired, I think Ginsburg has stepped into that role. And in particular, she's the one who is likely to weigh in the most sharply when the liberals are in dissent. Uh, in the past five years, she's written more dissenting opinions than any other single justice. Uh, and in this past term, we'll probably hear about them in a moment, uh, her opinions were especially important and interesting. Uh, she delivered five of them orally. And I can't, reaching back in my memory of the court, I can't think of any term where any justice has delivered an oral a dissent five times in one term. It's unusual to do it at all. And she points out, you do that not only when you think the court is wrong, but when you think the case is really grievously misguided. That is a terrible mistake. Well, she thought that five times this term. And uh, Shelby County is, of course, one of the striking examples of this particular term. So she's been an important dissenter and an important justice. In the two Title Seven cases that I mentioned, she has done as she did a earlier in the Ledbetter case and suggested that the court has made a mistake. It's time for Congress to step in and do something about it. Last takeaway from the 2012, 2012-2013 uh, term is that uh, the Roberts Court has made it to the opera stage. Now, I don't know. Somebody may correct me. I can't think of another opera about the Supreme Court. It's not the sort of place that lends itself to the drama of Verdi or Wagner. But uh, you know that Scalia and Ginsburg famously have bond a, a disagree on everything else, but they both love opera. They go to the opera together. So a recent graduate of the University of Maryland uh, School of Law actually composed an opera. I don't know how they have time as law students at Maryland to compose operas, but believe me, students at UVA don't have that kind of free time. But this, this chap used Scalia's and Ginsburg's writings to, to compose an opera, and he set it to the style, he said, of Verdi and Puccini and Bizet and some of the others. He asked Scalia and Ginsburg for permission to quote their works, and they said, well, you don't need permission. It's out there in the public sphere. But uh, he got their blessing anyway. Apparently, they went to the first performance, liked it, went backstage to congratulate the composer. So the, the Roberts Court has become it not only a lesson to all of us as lawyers and law students, but apparently an inspiration for people in the arts as well. So a few, those are a few impressionistic thoughts about the most recent term. We now get to the heart of the, the three big ones, the Voting Rights Act, affirmative action, same-sex marriage. I turn it to my colleagues. So it's not fair to Jane, but we changed the order on her. So I'm actually Risa Galyubuff, for those of you who don't know me, and Carrie Abrams is at the end. Uh, Professor Ford Misery stays in the middle, so he's good. Um, when I was clerking at the court, actually, there were two TV shows about the Supreme Court. Uh, and I don't think they lasted more than a season, because it turns out, really, not just not opera, but not TV either. Um, thank you all for coming today. I know you have a lot of other options on a beautiful Thursday afternoon, so we're happy to see you here.
here. Um, and it's a pleasure for me to be here to talk about Shelby County v. Holder. I am going to talk about three things, and then depending on how long it takes me, I might have one errant thought at the end. So the three things I'll talk about are the Act itself, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and its history, the case, and uh, the consequences of the case. Okay. So first I want to talk about the act, the history of it, and how it worked and how the portion that got struck down fit into uh, the rest of the act. So I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the act, and I am a constitutional historian, so this is going to be some deep background. To me, the story of Shelby County v. Holder begins with the Reconstruction Amendments. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Civil War happens, the Civil War ends, we get uh, some of the most uh, tumultuous and revolutionary amendments to the Constitution uh, in our 200 odd year history. The 13th Amendment and slavery and involuntary servitude. The 14th Amendment, among other things, requires due process of law and equal protection of the laws. And the 15th Amendment prohibits uh, restrictions on the right to vote on the basis of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. So for some years after the end of the Civil War and the passage of these amendments, African Americans in the South participate in politics. They uh, live full uh, lives. They, they always live full lives, but they live uh, largely, not entirely, um, as part of the communities in which they are, and particularly in a political sense. They are really, they run for office, they hold office, they um, are voting, they are serving on juries. Uh, and then by the late 19th century, that starts to decline. You all know the story of Jim Crow. You get segregation, exclusion, uh, uh, disenfranchisement, violence, e economic exclusion exploitation, lynching, and all kinds of repression. Now, all throughout this period, African Americans are resisting in various ways. Uh, that resistance takes off uh, during and after World War II especially, and by the early 1960s, you see the mass phase of what we have come to call the Civil Rights Movement, sit-ins, boycotts, marches, protests of all kinds, uh, which lead to incredible uh, federal legislative success. I mean incredible federal legislative success success, much of how we understand our workplaces, our schools, federal funding, public accommodations come out of successes of the Civil Rights Movement, particularly the 1964 Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act. All right, so that was like 100 years, pretty quick. So the 1965 Voting Rights Act creates federal oversight over elections. And it's not the first time that the federal government tries to create such oversight. In previous uh, very watered down versions of civil rights laws that had been managed to be passed before this, um, there were efforts to monitor elections and voting that largely failed. So when this act gets passed, it has a number of parts to it. And I'm just going to mention three. So part of the act, section two, prohibits discrimination in voting and in elections on the basis of race or color. It's an enforcement of uh, the 15th Amendment and also the 14th Amendment. Uh, Congress is explicitly given in all three of the Reconstruction Amendments, Congress is explicitly given the power to enforce those amendments. Uh, and that's crucial. So the first thing applies everywhere all across the nation. A prohibition on discrimination. Eventually as a result of Supreme Court cases uh, and then amendments in response, uh, that applies not only to practices that are intentionally discriminatory but also those that have a discriminatory impact even if they are not intentionally discriminatory. This part of the Voting Rights Act is permanent and it requires no renewal. It's just a law that's passed and will forever until repealed uh, be in force. And this part of the Voting Rights Act can be enforced through litigation in federal court. So the Department of Justice uh, can sue. But as you can imagine, elections are fast, litigation is slow, uh, and remedies after the fact by uh, through litigation are often uh, too late and too little and don't have as much uh, effectiveness as one might hope. So. In order to uh, create more effective remedies, the Voting Rights Act also created a few other sections. So one is Section 5, and Section 5 required that certain states or counties, those that were from covered jurisdictions, that's Section 4 and that's the real meat of this case, um, had to pre-clear any change in their election procedures with either the Department of Justice or the Federal District Court in Washington, D.C. So before they made a change, before they changed 
say, a location to vote before they changed a voter ID law, before they changed uh, their districts, right? This is why redistricting goes through all this litigation. Um, before they could make any changes, they had to get permission. So section 4B, we are finally uh, approaching Shelby County. That's the issue in Shelby County. Section 4B is where Congress created the formula for covered jurisdictions. Who would have to be pre-cleared? And those jurisdictions, the formula said that it was those jurisdictions in which fewer than 50% of the population were registered to vote or voted in either 1964, 1968, or 1972 presidential elections. This obviously and was intended to uh, include most of the South plus parts of New York, California, and oddly, and I do not know why, uh, I'd be happy to look it up, but I couldn't tell you, South Dakota, parts of South Dakota. Um, so there is a bailout provision if a covered jurisdiction has good behavior for uh, five years, meaning that they uh, they don't uh, try to pre-clear something that is problematic, um, then they can get bailed out of being covered and they'll no longer be covered. Very few jurisdictions have been bailed out, um, although a few have, and several have been added in over the course of time. So the Voting Rights Act was renewed four times, because each time this part, this portion of the Voting Rights Act, the covered jurisdictions, had uh, had time limitations. And the last time it was renewed was in 2006. It was renewed for 25 more years in a 98 to 0 vote. If I make it to my final comment, I'll talk more about that 98 to 0 vote. Um, as Professor Howard said, in 2009, the court indicated that there might be some constitutional problems uh, with the renewal of Section uh, 4B, and in fact, uh, in 2013, it now strikes it down. So here's the case. That's the background. Here's the case. Shelby County, Alabama, challenges Section 4. It's a facial challenge to the uh, coverage provisions and the coverage formula, and the Supreme Court strikes it down. It's a very clean case. It is 5-4, straight down ideological lines. Justice Thomas has a very short concurrence, and that concurrence he merely suggests that he would have struck down Section 5 as well, the, the part that sets forth the preclearance procedure. So the court leaves that intact. That's not what the challenge is to. So if Congress this is getting a little ahead of ourselves, but if Congress were to repass a new formula, then it would be subject to those Section 5 preclearance rules. They're still intact um, rules. But it, it seems like the court is likely to strike down Section 5 if it ever came before it, but maybe it wouldn't. Um, uh, but but uh, Justice Thomas says that he would. It's also a clean opinion, and this goes to something that Professor Howard said, it's also a clean opinion because Justice Roberts writes the majority opinion and Justice Ginsburg writes the dissent. And there is one majority and there is one dissent. And it is clear that the camps are created. They are aligned and the ranking person in each camp is writing for their whole camp. And people are, it seems, in, in, in much agreement. Um, so the, there are several disagreements uh, between the majority and the dissent. And I want to start out with an evidentiary disagreement. So it's clear uh, that between the time the 1965 Voting Rights Act was passed and 2006 when it was renewed, a lot has changed. And the question is, how much and what does it mean, right? So part of why I gave you that background was so you could have a sense of what led up to the 1965 Act. It's now the case, as the majority says, as Robert says in his opinion, that there are some covered jurisdictions that have reached parity in terms of the uh, racial identity of their voters, of their registered and turning out voters, uh, has reached parity with some non-covered jurisdictions, and there are some covered jurisdictions that even have a better turnout of minorities uh, and better registration of minorities than jurisdictions that are not covered. And the question is, what do you make of that kind of evidence. And the majority and the dissent make very different things of that kind of evidence. So according to the majority, that means the act has worked and its work is done. Uh, that the extraordinary remedies, the court uses the words extraordinary a lot, right? The extraordinary remedies uh, that, that led to the 1965 act uh, are no longer necessary. It's no longer fair to the covered states that they be covered when they are better, they're doing better um, in terms of voter registration and voter turnout than the non-covered states, uh, and it seems to penalize the South. So the court suggests that, that Congress initially had authority to pass the Voting Rights Act, but with these change conditions, uh, it no longer has it. According to Justice Ginsburg, 
these numbers mean something different. To her, these numbers mean the act is working and we should continue to allow it to work, that the preclearance mechanism is actually preventing discrimination and if you take it away, it will stop working. Uh, and she cites a lot of evidence. I, I brought the opinion with me. The opinion is quite long and, and the dissent is quite long. Uh, and a lot of the dissent is taken up with evidence that Justice Ginsburg uh, cites from the congressional record um, uh, and the congressional hearing. So uh, one little factoid that she thinks is important is that um, uh, since 2006, there were 700 preclearance requests that were denied, activities that, that cover jurisdictions wanted to take or changes they wanted to make uh, that the Department of Justice or the federal court said no to. And in addition, there were 800 that were either altered or withdrawn. Uh, so they never got to the point of being blocked because they were uh, changed or withdrawn. So that's about 1,500 uh, in uh, a several year period. And uh, she not only cites that number, but she also cites some of the kinds of um, uh, changes that were blocked. So these included canceling elections in a particular town when too many black candidates were on the ballot, uh, an attempt to return to a dual registration system that was identical to one from 1892, the shift to at-large voting instead of district voting uh, when black candidates win in city elections. As you can imagine, if you're a minority of the vote, uh, then at-large elections are going to lead if people are voting along racial lines, which they often do, uh, then you are going to end up with only white candidates winning if you have at-large election as opposed to district-based elections, the movement of polling places, and not just the movement of polling places, the movement of polling places, you know, on the day of elections, the movements of polling places to places where um, there are uh, too few parking spots for the number of voters, things like that, uh, and even the prosecution of uh, black candidates for elected office. Um, so on the one hand, uh, the majority says, well, we've made great progress, and now these extraordinary remedies aren't necessary. We have succeeded. And on the other hand, uh, the dissent says, no, we haven't. Here are the things that are still going on. If you take this away, they're going to get worse. Um, it's not just an evidentiary debate. The debate goes to, I think, vastly different views on a lot of things, right? They, they, these are the majority in the dissent in a lot of cases. Uh, but there are two in particular that I think are really motivating this case. Um, one is federalism, and one is race and the history of race. So on federalism, I think it's really important to view this case in the context of what has been called the, federalist, the federalism revolution at the Supreme Court, uh, which really began during the Rehnquist Court and has continued into the Roberts Court, and healthcare was a clear instance of being part of that uh, debate. So for about 20 years, the Supreme Court has uh, been concerned, increasingly concerned, about the dignity of the states, the sovereignty of the states, and the independence of the states. Uh, and one, and there have been a number of doctrinal manifestations of this. Um, and one of them has been the court's uh, attitude toward Congress's powers under the Reconstruction Amendments. When the 1965 Voting Rights Act was first passed, the court was quite deferential to Congress's power. Uh, and over time, and in the last 20 years, the court has gotten much less deferential. And I think this is an indication uh, and a continuation of that. And in addition to being part of this larger conversation, I think that uh, there's language in here and a suggestion of yet another um, uh, building block in the, uh, the doctrinal structure of, uh, of protecting the states. So the, um, the court talks about equal sovereignty, right? The, one of the things that it finds upsetting about the, um, the, the preclearance procedure and particularly the coverage formula and the fact that there are southern states with better records now than non-southern states is that the states are being treated unequally. And so the court talks about the fundamental uh, value of equal state sovereignty. Justice Ginsburg gets quite exercised about this and says the fundamental principle of equal state sovereignty that we've talked about in the past only only really um, uh, referred to the introduction and admission of new states into the Union. It didn't talk about their treatment once in the Union. And you can think of many, many examples of unequal state treatment by Congress. States are treated unequally uh, all the time. Um, but I, I do think, I, I will also say, in case you're wondering, the Constitution itself doesn't say anything about equal state sovereignty. I, I looked just to make sure. Um, uh, it's not in there, but neither are lots of other things that we talk about. I don't mean that as a trump that it can't possibly be true. 
Uh, I just mean in case you had it in the back of your head. Maybe that's in Article 4. No, uh, it's not in Article 4. Um, but the, the, uh, the problem of equal state sovereignty, I think, is going to be added to the problem of how we define the Commerce Clause and the Tenth Amendment and uh, um, uh, commandeering and all the other aspects that have been part of the Federalism Resolution. I am almost out of time, so I'm going to just say very quickly that the second big disagreement uh, between the justices obviously has to do with how you conceive of race and how you conceive of the relationship between the racial history of the United States and the racial present of the United States. And it's part of an ongoing conversation that I think Professor Ford Mesrui is likely to talk about some as well in the affirmative action cases about what the problem was with Jim Crow and therefore what the solution, the constitutional solution that the Reconstruction Amendment created uh, and what Congress is allowed to do then in response. So if one thinks very quickly that the problem of Jim Crow is a problem of governmental actors thinking about race when they make decisions, then we may be largely past that problem. Uh, and it's clear that the manifestation of that viewpoint, which most of the people in the majority adhere to, uh, generally in the voting rights case, is that the problem that the Voting Rights Act was intended to fix was a problem of voter exclusion a voter exclusion, uh, uh, race-based, violent, adamant voter exclusion. Uh, and therefore, this has outlived, the, the Voting Rights Act uh, uh, coverage has outlived its usefulness. Uh, the dissent would say, no, actually, the problem with Jim Crow was racial inequality. The problem the 1965 Act was meant to fix was not merely the inability to register and vote. It was the inability to be full members of, uh, of our polity. And uh, we still face that when we have uh, various kinds of um, uh, new mechanisms for uh, excluding people, suppressing their vote, um, uh, and things like that. I won't get into Justice Breyer's tree disease analogy that he talked about at the oral argument, because I am almost out of time. But let me just say one last thing. I was at the oral argument, um, and you could hear a pin drop uh, in this oral argument a few different times. And there were two moments in particular that I want to point to. One is that. Uh, the 98 to 0 vote. Uh, Justice Scalia suggested that the 98 to 0 vote um, was really an indication that there was a racial prerogative, a racial entitlement uh, to. Uh, to certain offices, I think, was the implication. And there was an audible gasp in the audience uh, at Justice Scalia's comment. Um, so that, that's one thing I want to say, and I want to link it to something else. At one point in the oral argument, I believe it was Justice Alito, asked Solicitor General uh, Verrilli, um, are you saying that people in the South are more racist than people elsewhere in the country? Uh, and Solicitor General Verrilli said, no, no, absolutely not, absolutely not. And it struck me that we were talking around and about two different kinds of taboo. Uh, and two different kinds of envisioning the equilibrium that we have today in what a lot of people like to call a post-civil rights or a post-racial world. And in one of them, the post-racial world is to say, we have fixed the problem that we had, and you can no longer say the South is more racist. It's not OK to talk in those kinds of terms. And that's what Justice Alito was saying when he asked uh, uh, Don Verrilli that, and Don Verrilli's response was, of course not, I would never say that. That is not acceptable today as it was in 1965. Um, the other equilibrium is the equilibrium in Congress, that it's not acceptable not to vote for the Voting Rights Act. And that's what upset Justice Scalia. And he's right to say it's not acceptable, right? No one voted against it, and two people seem to have wanted to and didn't show up, right? That's how you get the 98. And that suggests a very different equilibrium, right? An equilibrium that we need federal intervention. We accept that the federal intervention is going to happen. We recognize that there are still problems on the ground. And you know what? We don't really want to talk about that either, right? Nobody wants to have these. Right now, they had hearings. It's not that nobody talked about anything. But there, there are things that we don't want to contest, but they're incredibly different things that we don't want to contest. And they show us very different uh, visions of the world. And one thing, I didn't even get to consequences. I'm so sorry. I'll talk about that after. You all know the consequences. You've been reading the newspapers. Um, but the, uh, the, the one thing I want to say is that you can see all of this in these opinions. It is crystal clear that there are these two different ways of understanding the relationship between the past and the present and the future. The justices are talking about it. They see it. They see what's at stake. They don't talk about the partisan politics at stake going forward, uh, but they definitely see all the things at stake. I'm sorry I went over, and thank you very much.
Terrific. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'm going to talk about Fisher versus United States, uh, Fisher versus University of Texas. Uh, it is its own country, as you know, but uh, <clears throat> anyhow. Uh, in Fisher versus University of Texas, Abigail Fisher sues the university, claiming that their use of race in admissions violates the Equal Protection Clause. To understand her claim in the case, you need to understand something about how U of T conducts its admissions process. It, it, in, it uses two tracks, both of which are designed to create racial diversity. So the first track is called the Top 10% Plan and actually admits over 80% of the entering freshman class. Under this plan, if you graduate in the top 10% of your high school in Texas, you're automatically admitted to the University of Texas. This creates diversity because several school districts in Texas are overwhelmingly black and overwhelmingly Latino. So the top 10% of those school districts also reflect those races. The result is roughly 4 to 5% uh, blacks from this process and about 15, 16% of the enter entering class uh, are Latino. The other track is a more individualized process that, to make up for the, the remaining you know, 15 to 20%. It looks at all the things you'd expect, academic credentials, uh, SAT scores, personal uh, achievement, leadership, extracurricular activities, economic background, and in some cases, race. The two racial groups that benefit most from the attention to race are blacks and Latinos. It's the second track, the individualized track, that Abigail Fisher is challenging. So uh, for the first years in the room, or for those who've forgotten con law, the rule that the Supreme Court applies to race-based admissions by public universities is called strict scrutiny, and it requires that the university be able to show that the use of race is necessary to achieve a compelling governmental interest. And by necessary, the court says that means there are not race-neutral alternative ways of achieving the compelling interest. Using race is indispensable at, to some degree in achieving it. And the compelling interest means it has to be something very important. And in earlier precedents, beginning with Bakke, University of California versus Bakke in 1978, and then uh, 2003, Grutter versus uh, Bollinger involving the Michigan Law School, the court accepts that racial diversity on a student body is a compelling government interest. And the court accepts that using race can be necessary to achieving that. Now, it has to be used in a nuanced, one of many factors, holistic review of the candidate way. It cannot use a quota, uh, the university, and it cannot assign some fixed set of points to race for every applicant. So in Fisher, the trial court, the district court, and the Court of Appeals both concluded that the University of Texas had modeled its individualized race-based admissions process on the, that that was upheld in Grutter in the University of Michigan Law School case, that it was a nuanced use of race to achieve the com compelling government interest of student body diversity. Abigail Fisher's argument, which she then took all the way to the Supreme Court, was that in Texas's case, the use of race is not necessary. And that's because of the other track, the top 10% track. Here you have a race neutral program. It doesn't ask for applicants race. It says, where in your class did you graduate? So it's race neutral in the criteria that it uses. And it creates a significant degree of racial diversity. So Abigail Fisher's argument is, look, in this case, you don't need race. They have the top 10% plan. Plus, there are other factors, economic background, diversity essays that can also be used in the individualized process that further make the use of race potentially unnecessary. So the Supreme Court, in a 7 to 1 case with uh, Justice Kennedy writing the opinion and uh, Justice Ginsburg, the lone dissent, canvasses its precedent, gets to the question in the case, and doesn't decide it. What the court says is, we think the lower court was too lenient in applying strict scrutiny, didn't carefully analyze whether race is really necessary. So we're going to send it back down for you to reanalyze it, and we'll see. But presumably, the court uh, may well take the case back up. So I guess I'll sit down. They didn't decide anything. No. Um, but what to say about a case that, in some sense, uh, did not decide much? It's essentially postponing the day.
that it will revisit the issue. I think there are two important trends revealed in the opinion, even though not squarely addressed by the opinion. And these two trends are part of a larger trend towards colorblindness, towards the Supreme Court uh, requiring that government decision making always ignore race. So the two particular trends are first, the lessening of the importance of student body diversity as, as a value, as a benefit, uh, which means then that it is less likely to be persuasive as a justification for affirmative action. The second trend is a turn toward viewing race neutral policies that are designed to create racial diversity with the same strict scrutiny and therefore likely invalidation as the court has been applying to race based uh, admissions policies. So the first, the lessening of diversity. In the Bakke case, 1978, Justice Powell talked of diversity in a multiculturalist frame. He talked about race in ways that couldn't be substituted for things like economic background. Those were also important, but racial diversity itself brought in people from different ethnic and cultural backgrounds that then brought in with that different viewpoints and perspectives and outlooks that then enriched intellectual inquiry. By the time of Grutter, 25 years later in 2003, the court had drawn back from that, probably again reflecting turning towards the idea that race doesn't matter and government should not treat it as, as if it does. So in the Grutter opinion, even though the court upheld diversity as a compelling interest, the court does not talk about it as reflecting ethnic or cultural differences. If anything, it takes a, an opposite tack, that race does not matter, and that's what diversity teaches us. The value of having a diverse student body is actually showing, if you have a critical mass of black and Latino students, then the other students will see, oh wow, they don't all think alike. There's no minority perspective. There's as much diversity within a racial group as there is between racial groups. So if anything, race doesn't matter, with one exception. The court does acknowledge that race does predict a difference of perspective in a particular sense, that blacks and Latinos are more likely to have experienced discrimination. And that itself may affect their perspective on certain kinds of issues. So rather than it being multiculturalist as in Baki, the court in Grutter says race doesn't matter except for the negative experience of discrimination that, uh, that it may bring in. But the court in Grutter did expand diversity while it was drawing back from it to recognize political legitimacy as a benefit of racially diverse schools when schools, especially elite law schools like Texas, Michigan, and UVA, graduate racially diverse student bodies, that in turn means that leadership's uh, positions in the country will also be visibly diverse and therefore show to the public that positions of power in society are open to all races. Turn to Fisher. Fisher does canvas the precedent so you get some idea of what it's thinking about even though it ended up not deciding the case. It continued the thin notion of diversity from Grutter as opposed to Bakke, the idea that race doesn't matter except perhaps for the negative experience of discrimination. It just kind of recounts Grutter's idea that racial diversity will help break down the stereotypes uh, of there being a minority perspective and the court drew back from the political legitimacy. It just doesn't mention that at all. It doesn't mention culture, and it doesn't mention political legitimacy in any respect. So all that's left then is diversity is useful to show that race doesn't matter, but perhaps that the perspective of being discriminated against might be useful. But it's a thinner conception of diversity than the court recognized in earlier precedents, and therefore less likely to be persuasive, ultimately, as a continuing justification for race-based admissions. The second trend, which is at least hinted at in the Fisher case, is this turn towards scrutinizing race-neutral policies more than the court has done in the past. So in prior cases, the debate has always been what to do with race-based decision-making, where the university or other kind of governmental entities
use race as a criteria in decision making. It was always assumed explicitly so that race neutral policies would be perfectly acceptable. Even the conservatives like Scalia said you could use race neutral if you want to promote uh, diversity in construction contracts, that's fine. Justice Thomas talked about race neutral ways Michigan could have created diversity. So even the most colorblind advocates on the court assume race neutral policies designed to create racial diversity are perfectly acceptable. But as I and other scholars have argued, the logic of the doctrine as the court is devising it in its move towards colorblindness suggests reasons to scrutinize race neutral policies at least more significantly than they, they have been uh, in the past, to view them as suspicious in similar ways that race-based policies are also viewed. So they would require having a heavy justification before they can be upheld. So to give you a way of con seeing the point, imagine if the University of Texas said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take the top 20% of all high school graduates from wealthy school districts. You say, well, why? Well, because, you know, too much immigration, we're getting too many Mexicans, too many blacks, we've got to keep the white numbers up. So we're going to emphasize, but it's race neutral, right? Just is it a wealthy school district and we're in the top 20%. Most people would predict that the Supreme Court would roundly criticize that, strike it down as racially discriminatory, even though it uses race neutral means. The court would say you're simply discriminating by proxy. Well, similarly, if, as the court is saying, policies with a racial purpose to benefit minorities are still objectionable, at least presumptively so, and have to satisfy heavy justification, then the court may well decide you can't avoid that justification simply by using a proxy of a race-neutral policy. And this case tees that up perfectly. Here you have the same university using a race-neutral policy and a race-based policy in the same, you know, admission cycle. Uh, and especially where here the race-neutral policy is robust in how many people it admits and in the degree of racial diversity it creates. So it invites a comparison of, well, is that better then or are they both problematic? And indeed, in this case, all three judges wrote separate opinions in the Court of Appeals and they all said, we are not here considering the question whether the top 10% plan is also constitutionally vulnerable. But they said so in a way that implied that they recognize there's a question there. And at the Supreme Court level, in Justice Ginsburg dissent, she also looked at the top 10% plan and said, why is that preferable to the race-based admissions from a constitutional perspective? Now in her case, she would uphold both. That's what her dissent was, she thinks the race-based program was perfectly uh, constitutional. But nonetheless, she made the point that however we view the race-based program, why should we view the race-neutral program any differently? It has the same racial purpose. So the upshot then is that the two, issue, two issues that Fisher did not decide nonetheless reveal something about the trend on the court, the lessening of the importance of diversity as a rationale, and the turn towards race neutral policies with increasing scrutiny, both of which suggest in the near future the end of race based admissions and perhaps in the not so distant future the end of all policies including those that use race neutral means. Thank you very much. So for those of you who came in late, I'm Professor Abrams and I'll be speaking about the two marriage equality cases that the court decided this term, Hollingsworth versus Perry and United States versus Windsor. So these were two really different cases, both involving whether there's a right to same-sex marriage, uh, but extremely different postures and the court decided to decide one of them on the merits and not the other. So let me tell you a little bit about each case and then I'll tell you about why one got dismissed on standing issues and the other didn't. And then I'll talk a little bit about the case Windsor that they did decide on the merits and about the features of that opinion. And then if I have time, I'll talk about what I think this means for the future. So Hollingsworth versus Perry. This was the Prop 8 case. This was the California Proposition 8 that you may have remembered passed in 
the same election as the presidential election in 2008. Uh, in May, I believe, of 2008, the California Supreme Court had decided a consolidated set of cases called in re marriage cases, in which they held that there was a constitutional right to same-sex marriage in the California Constitution, and therefore California had to allow same-sex couples to marry. And thousands of couples did marry in the next few months. Then the November election comes around, and Prop 8 is put on the ballot and wins by a very uh, slim majority. And the California Constitution is amended to say that marriage is only between a man and a woman. So the Perry case uh, uh, comes up before the court in, in an, kind of an unusual, after an unusual series of events. So it starts out in district court in Oakland. And this is the first marriage equality case where there was a trial. All the other ones have been decided on summary judgment. But this judge allowed it to go to trial. And uh, it turned out differently at trial than it does it, than some of the cases had on summary judgment. A lot of the arguments against marriage equality that sounded really good on summary judgment didn't sound so good when witnesses were being cross-examined at trial. So a lot of the uh, opposition's witnesses were just eviscerated. The other thing that happened was it was hard for them to find witnesses who were willing to testify against same-sex marriage. And so there weren't very many witnesses on that side. Uh, the judge uh, held that the that Prop 8 was unconstitutional for a variety of reasons, uh, including that heightened scrutiny should apply, uh, just as it does in the, ra in the race cases that, that uh, Risa and Kim were talking about. Um, and it went on to the Ninth Circuit. The Ninth Circuit upheld the district court's conclusion, but for different reasons. And this was one of the most creative constitutional arguments I've ever seen. This was uh, Judge Reinhardt in the Ninth Circuit. He said, Okay, California had marriage and got rid of it. And California has domestic partnerships for gays and lesbians that give all the same benefits as marriage. So the only thing we're talking about here is whether a state can take the word marriage away from a group of people. And why would a state do that? There's no evidence that, that they did this for any reason other than an animus towards gays and lesbians and not thinking that they are deserving of having the term marriage apply to them. So therefore, under precedents such as Romer versus Evans, a Kennedy gay rights opinion, uh, applying a kind of rational basis with bite uh, level of review. Uh, this doesn't even pass rational basis review. It's irrational for the state to do it. It's illegitimate for the state to do it. There's no reason for the state to do it. So why would the Ninth Circuit judge have done that? Probably because he thought it set up an easy way for the Supreme Court to, to, to strike down Prop 8 without having to say, now every state in the country has to have same-sex marriage. It's limited to these states that offered it, took it away, and have civil unions or domestic partnerships that are exactly the same. In other words, California. Um, actually, Washington State was going through its process of adopting marriage equality at the same time, and I kind of wondered if they were going to stop when this opinion came down, because it's the Ninth Circuit, and say, uh-oh, if we do this, we can't take it back, but it didn't, it didn't stop them. So this goes up before the Supreme Court and hopes that they would uh, affirm the Ninth Circuit's opinion on the same basis, I think, were dashed when Justice Kennedy said during oral argument, that's kind of a weird argument, isn't it? Or something like that. that I don't remember if that's exactly what he said, but he did not get what the Ninth Circuit was trying to do at all, even though I think what they were trying to do was use his previous opinions to get him to, to his vote. Uh, instead, uh, they dismissed Perry on standing issues. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the, the reasons why in a minute. The other case, United States versus Windsor, was the case challenging the Federal Defense of Marriage Act. So here we have a federal law passed in 96 in the Clinton administration, during the Clinton administration, uh, that says that for federal purposes, marriage is between one man and one woman. At the time it was passed, no states had, had adopted marriage equality, but by the time it goes up uh, before the Supreme Court um, in, in Windsor, I think it was up to maybe 11, and now we're up to 13. Uh, so the, the facts on the ground had changed a lot between when Congress acted and when the Supreme Court is considering the constitutionality of that action. Uh, Windsor was a case about a state tax. You all should take tax. It's way more interesting than you thought. Um, uh, an 83-year-old woman whose uh, partner of over, over 40 years had died um, had gotten an over $300,000 estate tax bill from the IRS because the federal government did not consider them to be married, even though New York State did. And so she was challenging uh, DOMA based on this enormous tax bill that she'd gotten. So uh, we have uh, one case about whether 
a state can prohibit gays and lesbians from marrying each other, and one case about whether the federal government can override what a state has done and refuse to recognize those marriages that states allowed. So Perry gets dismissed on standing grounds and Windsor doesn't. And I don't think that there's, I mean, federal court scholars will be arguing for years about whether there's a reason why one should have been dismissed and one the other shouldn't. I just think the justices could reach conclusion on, on Windsor that they wanted to strike down DOMA and couldn't decide Perry. Um, because on the ground, the facts look so similar. You had a problem in both cases with the appealing party not really being a party to the litigation. In Perry, the state of California refused to continue to litigate the case after losing at the trial court level. So you have a winning, uh, two winning couples who are not able to appeal because they won at trial court, and a government that refuses to take the appeal. And so the proponents of Proposition 8, some of the people who had funded and gotten the signatures to put it on the ballot were the people bringing the appeal. Which kind of makes sense, I guess, if the government won't defend something, maybe the people who were kind of a proxy for the voters get to, get to do it instead. Windsor, you had a very similar situation where the Obama administration was refusing to defend DOMA. And so the bipartisan legal, what are they called? Bipartisan, I don't remember what it means, BLAG. It's a lovely acronym, right? Um, uh, bla uh, it's, it's, it's the um, group that, bipartisan legal advisory group, yeah, of the, of the House of Representatives. Uh, gets to defend the law that Congress passed. So you have, again, kind of the people who voted for the law getting to, to say that it's constitutional when the government itself won't do it. But in Perry, for a variety of reasons, they decide that, that those people didn't have standing, and in Windsor, they decide that Blagg does have standing. So Windsor's the case that, that goes forward, and in Perry, only the district court opinion is now good law because there was no standing even to go to the Ninth Circuit. So the Ninth Circuit opinion is wiped out, and now we are left with the district court opinion striking down Prop 8 in California, which is why same-sex couples are now marrying in California again. Okay, so what happens in Windsor? Justice Kennedy, in the 5-4 opinion, uh, strikes down DOMA. And for those of you who have read some other Justice Kennedy opinions, this is exactly what you would expect. So Justice Kennedy, in all of his gay rights opinions, this is now the third, there was Romer, uh, Lawrence versus Texas, and now this one, about one every decade, um, loves to decide these cases uh, using rational basis review without really articulating the right at stake all that clearly. So here he mentions due process and mentions equal protection. It seems to be an equal protection argument in, in the, at, at the end of the day. Um, and he says that a bare desire to harm a politically unpopular group is not a legitimate purpose for a law. So it's kind of like the animus argument we've seen in other rational basis cases. There are lots of legitimate reasons a government may pass a law, but just animus towards a particular group or a bare desire to harm that group is not enough. And that's what he concluded was going on here in, in the Defense of Marriage Act. And there was a lot of uh, congressional testimony back from the mid-90s that showed that. In fact, some of the justices read some of it from the bench during oral argument when they were questioning the lawyers. Like, oh, you, you say that that's not the reason for DOMA? Well, what about this? And they had some really uh, uh, lovely quotations from, from some of the uh, Congress people who had voted for it um, that sounded really homophobic and, and hateful. So it was pretty easy to make that case. Um, but he doesn't rely just on the the congressional testimony, he also relies on a federalism argument that's kind of buried in the equal protection argument that has the potential, I think, to limit the, the holding of the case. And that's that he said, look, family law is usually a, an area of state law. States decide who gets to marry. States decide what are the grounds for divorce. States decide child custody. States do all of that. It's really unusual for Congress to intervene in this, in, in this this kind of an issue. And so when we see something that unusual, we might want to take a really close look at it. It reminded me a little bit of an article that Professor Ford Mansoury wrote a few years ago where he said that when uh, courts use tradition as a reason for a law, you should take a close look at it. He used a similar language. He said close consideration uh, to, at, at, at cases where there's something unusual going on. He doesn't say strict scrutiny, just close consideration. Um, and so it's so strange for Congress to be intervening in family law that we know something strange is going on, and then he concludes that that strange thing is this bare animus or bare desire to, to harm a politically unpopular group. So 
Um, what does it mean for DOMA to be struck down? Obviously for Edie Win Windsor, it means that she no longer owes over $300,000 in estate taxes, but it also means anyone who was married in a jurisdiction that allowed same-sex marriage and still lives there is now married for federal purposes. So if I'm married to another woman in Maryland or New York or Iowa or any of the other 13 states that provide it, I am now married for state purposes and for federal purposes. And it's, it, I, everything's covered. For people who aren't living in one of those states, it's still unclear what Windsor means. So if I get married in Maryland or DC and then come back to Virginia to live in Virginia, Virginia does not recognize my marriage. Virginia has an amendment on the books that doesn't, not only doesn't recognize marriages, doesn't recognize marriages for people who leave and then come back, doesn't recognize contracts that look like marriage, doesn't recognize civil unions, nothing. Um, so if the federal government is now going to recognize people who are married um, in, in same-sex unions, but Virginia isn't, what, what happens to my federal benefits in Virginia? Is there, are they gonna recognize me when I'm living in a state that wouldn't recognize my marriage? And so far, this is happening, rolling out agency by agency. So agencies have been using for years in other contexts like common law marriage or the age at which you can get married, um, uh, two different rules. One is the celebration rule and one is a domicile or residency rule. And so the celebration rule is if the marriage was valid, where you got married, you got your license, you went through your ceremony, it was valid there, then it's valid anywhere. And the residency rule is if the marriage is valid in the state in which you are domiciled, then it's, then it's valid for federal purposes. So the Department of Homeland Security very quickly after this opinion, after Windsor came down, acted to say that um, anyone who is married um, in any place where it's valid, so the celebration rule, um, can now sponsor a spouse for immigration purposes or someone who is seeking to be naturalized can have the shorter residency period you get for being a spouse of a US citizen, um, regardless of where they live. And that wasn't really a big surprise to those of us who do immigration law because the celebration rule has been what they've used in other, in, in other contexts that didn't involve gay couples. Uh, the IRS a couple of weeks ago came out with an opinion saying that they're going to apply the celebration rule. And that actually has a lot of really tricky consequences for employee benefits in ERISA. Um, but the obvious easy consequence is that now if you live in Virginia and you are legally married somewhere else, even though Virginia doesn't recognize it, you need to pay federal taxes as if you're married. Your Virginia taxes might still be another matter, but the federal taxes will be as if you're married. And for those of you who've taken tax, you know that means if your incomes are very different, you'll get a nice bonus, and if your incomes are almost the same, then you'll get a hefty penalty. <laughs> so the, the very sad re result for some couples is if they don't need immigration benefits and they have the same income as each other and they live in Virginia, the only outcome at this point from Windsor is that their tax bill has increased <laughs> and nothing else, except if they hold on for the estate tax, you know, hold on till death, then, then, then you won't have to pay the estate tax bill. But uh, it's, this is, these are the, the, the benefits that have currently been extended. There are other federal agencies that are still trying to decide what to do. I think the Department of Labor is still looking at this. They had a domicile rule, and so they've been told to reconsider what the rule is going to be. They could switch to a celebration rule. That would mean things like the Family Medical Leave Act apply to same-sex married couples living in Virginia, um, or uh, that Social Security benefits would extend, but it's still, it's still too early uh, to know what's going on with all of that. Um, one other thing about the potential impact of Windsor is that, you know, Kennedy really carefully cabined this, I think, to, by using this federalism rationale to try to, maybe to try to get five votes, I don't know, maybe, but to, to say this is, you know, we're striking down a federal law here who's, who's trampling on these states' rights to determine who can be married in their state. So one way of reading Windsor is to say, this is only applies to DOMA, this is a one-off case, this doesn't apply to uh, other laws like Virginia's marriage amendment. But another way of reading Windsor is to say, the logic, the reasoning that Kennedy uses, this a bare desire or to harm a politically unpopular group or animus, applies just as much in states that have marriage amendments. And that seems to be what Justice Scalia thinks. So Justice Scalia 
did something in his dissent that I've never seen. I, maybe you have, Professor Howard, because you've read more Supreme Court opinions than I do. I have. I've never seen this before. He used the strikeout key, the strike through key, um, to, and he struck through the word DOMA repeatedly and quoted the majority and said, just add the state's law. You know, so he, he thinks that by the reasoning of the majority, there's no way that state bans on same-sex marriage can stand uh, because the, the, same, the same reasoning that this is really based on animus would apply there as well. Um, and he calls it inevitable, easy, uh, and here, here's just a little language from the end of, the, the, uh, of his dissent. That court, which finds it so horrific that Congress irrationally and hatefully robbed same-sex couples of the, quote, personhood and dignity, those are Kennedy's words, uh, which state legislatures conferred upon them, will of a certitude be similarly appalled by state legislatures' irrational and hateful failure to acknowledge that personhood and dignity in the first place. As far as this court is concerned, no one should be fooled. It is just a matter of listening and waiting for the other shoe. I have this image of Justice Scalia sitting there. <laughs> is it about to drop? Um, and so the implication there seemed, and he was right about Lawrence, right? He says something very similar in his dissent in Lawrence versus Texas. The majority says this isn't about gay marriage. The majority says this is just about striking down a sodomy law. And then 10 years later, he's right. They extend that kind of reasoning to cover same-sex marriage, at least in the DOMA context. So he seems to be sort of making a, a similar prediction about what's going to happen in the future. Um, so far, we've got two lawsuits filed in Virginia. There are others around the country. Uh, one in the Western District, one in the Eastern District. One, the first that I know of, class action, uh, brought by the ACLU of Virginia in the Western District of Virginia. Uh, what they're trying to do, I learned yesterday on a panel that I was on with the president of the ACLU of Virginia, is avoid what happened in California after the Supreme Court didn't or dismissed Perry on, on the standing grounds. Uh, they don't want a situation where some uh, clerks are saying, oh, that decision only applies to certain counties in which the people who brought the case live. So you've had clerks in uh, clerk's offices in California refusing to marry people because they say, oh, no, the district court opinion only applied to Alameda and, and Los Angeles counties. It doesn't apply to me in Orange County. Um, so they want a class action so that it'll be clear that if they win, all of Virginia is covered by the class action. Um, one final just quick thought about why they may not have decided Perry on the merits. This is a really strange lineup. So most of the cases we've talked about today, it's really predictable who's on which side, and Windsor was like that too. In Perry, let me just read you. Roberts wrote the opinion, uh, dismissing the case for lack of standing, joined by Scalia, Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kagan and Kennedy dissents joined by Thomas Alito and Sotomayor. So those seem to be the four people who wanted to decide the case, and I was really puzzled by Kennedy dissenting because he seems so pro-marriage equality in Windsor. I can't imagine he actually wanted to write an opinion in Perry going the other way, but maybe, maybe he did. Um, so this makes me think either that the justices didn't have a clear sense of where they would come out and no one could predict whether there were five votes um, and they were afraid, um, or maybe they really meant the standing holding, I don't know. Um, or I also kind of wonder if they just are hoping that the political process will <clears throat> let this play out on its own and they don't have to intervene. So Ginsburg, for example, in the group who dismissed the case for lack of standing has been a big critic of Roe v. Wade. And she's been a critic of Roe v. Wade because she thinks that it interfered in the political process and actually galvanized the pro-life movement and was damaging over time and that states would have eased up restrictions on abortion on their own if the Supreme Court hadn't intervened. So I kind of wonder if the justices are really aware of the poll data that shows how much public opinion on this issue has shifted over the last 10 years and think that even states like Virginia that are slow um, will get there eventually and that they don't have to do something as uh, traumatic for the nation as forcing states to adopt these laws who, who aren't quite there yet. That's just my speculation. Thanks.